Now I know that I am one of the lucky ones. I can stand here today and speak about my son's recovery. Being a part of YPR is my way of giving back to the recovery community. The only way we can make a difference is to get involved. We all have a voice, and if we don't use it to make changes, there will be no change. Use your voice and get involved. It could save a life. Our first speaker tonight is Chief Devella.
two things over the years that I was always concerned about, right, is when one of my kids get behind the wheel of the car and they start driving, you know, I worry about not just their inexperience as a driver, right, but other drivers out on the road potentially getting in a car accident with them, especially with distracted driving today, etc., and so forth and so on. But now, as a father, I have to worry about my son or daughter or both of them being exposed to heroin, right? So now that is a very big fear of mine. That's why I present this video here tonight. This video is something that the Lacey Township Police Department, our municipal alliance, our Lacey Task Force actually began working on a year ago. Actually, we started this project in August. We're trying to come up with ways. We're always trying to come up with ways that we can do something to get the word out there, right, about this terrible heroin epidemic. So we came up with the idea of a PSA, public safety announcement. We immediately went to our school system. We have a great school system. Great superintendent, Greg Whitley, very, uh, very aggressive. He gave us pretty, pretty much carte blanche, okay, with a telecommunications class for students. And we began working on, we all began working on this video uh, last year, we just, uh, last August rather, and we just showed it uh, right night after this, this past March. So kids did a great job. They actually got a couple of awards for the time they put into it. But I kind of really think that that video sets the tone this evening. That's why I wanted to play it. And that's why I do what I do. That's why everybody here does what they do to decrease this heroin epidemic as best we can. You know, last year, I attended Overdose Awareness Day over at the Community Hall. Now, I know I'm jumping around a little bit, but like I said to you earlier, 26 years in, in law enforcement, myself included, Primarily law enforcement officers, up until I guess maybe the past couple of years, give or take, primarily only deal with right the enforcement side. Of it. Yes, police enforcement is an important prong of the, the five prong system we have, right? But it's not going to it's not going to get rid of this epidemic, and I know that, and everybody knows that. One of the best things I have done in my career, and I'm talking all 26 years, was attending Overdose Awareness Day last week, or last year rather, and meeting Donna Kaplan. Amazing, amazing work. And please give her a round of applause for everything she's done. She has, you know, attending that event made me realize that there's more to this heroin epidemic than just going out there and trying to uh, arrest people. Because we're not going to arrest our way out of this problem. You know, meeting her opened up my eyes to uh, education and prevention, treatment and recovery. And we pretty much started a partnership, I would say, right off the bat. We began speaking that night almost instantly. Donna came here to Lacey to hold her monthly meetings. She's absolutely amazing. I have a lot of respect for her. I have a lot of respect for everybody that works with her from Young People Recovery. And again, let's give a round of applause on that. This evening, uh, kind of going out of order a little bit, but this evening I put a very good friend of mine here, uh, Lieutenant Jeff Ryan. Uh, from Barnegat Township Police Department, uh, who probably known each about 20 years. And uh, he's going to talk for a few minutes, and then I'll come back. I thank you. Good evening, everyone. How's everybody doing? Good? Can everybody hear me? I hate microphones as well. So if I got to walk back there a little bit so everybody can hear me, just pull me back. Uh, let's see. See, a good amount of kids in the room as well as adults. How many of you kids in the room have brothers and sisters? Yeah? Uh, you get along well with them? You're tight with them? Could you ever imagine not having your brother or sister with you? No, right? No, right? Moms and dads in the room. You guys familiar with house parties? You guys have kids that have been to them? Nobody wants to raise their hand for that, right? Do you, know, do you know some families that have kids that go to these house parties? Yeah. House parties is mainly the drinking thing, right? Yeah. Let's, let, me, let, me, let, let me explain something to you. What do you guys think about, there's, there's the woods parties where kids are going to go out and drink in the woods, hang out, they may get behind the wheel and drive, potentially get in an accident and hurt themselves, hurt another, or kill somebody. So parents seem to think it might be a better idea to have house parties in the basements where they can collect the keys from all the kids so they don't have to worry about kids driving, drinking and driving. Does this sound logical? 
you know the kids are going to do it anyway, right? So let's have them at the house. Let's keep them there where we can protect them. Well, this may sound logical to some of you. Some of you may have done this for your kids or may have been involved in these types of parties when you were a teenager. I can tell you I was. See, I too have an old brother who is 43 now. I'm 41. And right around the age of 15, he started drinking. My parents knew about it. They were worried about him drinking and driving. So they knew that he was hanging out in the woods with his friends, drinking, and the friends were out there drinking, and they were worried that somebody was going to crash. So they told my brother, why don't you have all your friends come here? They can hang out in the basement. I'll collect all the keys. This way we know nobody can drink and drive. Well, this went on for a couple of years. The problem is, it didn't stop there. The drinking became marijuana. Right around that time, I became a police officer. He got a nice job working for Comcast. I'm sorry, Verizon. Started getting a little money because he had a good job. Marijuana became cocaine. That wasn't enough because the cocaine became prescription pills. Fed up. Then it became stealing the prescription pills from my father. That wasn't enough. Back to cocaine. Quit his job, took a buyout, $40,000, and put it all up his nose. The cocaine became crack. And today, my brother is a full blown heroin addict. Recovery, maybe. See, a year and a half ago, I don't want to jump around, but I didn't have a relationship with my brother probably for about 10 or 15 years when this occurred. You know, me rising in my career, I didn't want anything to happen. I didn't want him getting off on anything because I'm an officer. We hear about that all the time, so I kind of cut him off. No cards, no special privileges, nothing. But. He's also the godfather of my oldest son. I have two boys that are 10 and 12 right now. Hasn't seen him since he was a year and a half, his godfather. Doesn't even, didn't even know who he was. Well, imagine walking into your police department and seeing your own brother in the cell being arrested for stealing boat trailers to scrap for the weight for heroin. He got locked up in Stafford, he got locked up in Barnegat, finally made his way to prison. Thank God. He gets out, and talking to my parents, he's clean. He's clean, he's got a good job, he's doing well, everything is great. So what do I do? I let him in, right? He starts coming around. I'm looking at him. He does look pretty good. So I let him in. I introduce him, reintroduce him to his godson and, and my other son. He's hanging out at the house all the time, good old time. Then I get the call, July 1st. First from my mother, I don't answer. Next for my best friend in the police department, brother overdose. Eight hours before I'm having 100 people at my house. If it wasn't for my best friend being parked, talking to another officer less than 100 yards from the house he overdosed in, he wouldn't be here today. Because he was Narcan and came back. What I'm gonna tell you is, thinking about letting your kids drink, you don't. It led to where my brother is today. It has destroyed our family. I have very little relationship with my parents. 
They have no relationship with others in the family, the extended family. They are broke because they have enabled him, given him every ounce of their retirement to the point of, last year, my mother needed teeth work. She was missing teeth. She called me to ask me if by chance I could lend her the money for it. I said no. Because if I gave her the money, she would have given it to him. So what did I do? I called the dentist's office and put the teeth on my credit card. Then I called my mother back and said, go get your teeth fixed. Please do not let your kids drink. For you guys in the room, wait till you're of age. Startling statistic. Children who begin consuming alcohol at the age of 15 are five times more likely to have an addiction to alcohol for the rest of their lives. I'm not telling you that every person who has alcohol is going to become a heroin addict. What I will tell you is every heroin addict most likely started with alcohol. Thank you guys. Thank you, Jeff. I really appreciate you coming out. You know, I really asked Jeff, what's the reason why I asked him to come out here this evening? What's the show? But listen, nobody is immune from this heroin epidemic. I have so many friends that somebody in their family is going through something that has to do with heroin. And I thought Jeff would be good to come out here tonight and share, and share a story. So again, let's give Jeff a round of applause. So, Real quick, I just want to go over some statistics uh, in regard to heroin, so, and, and why the heroin uh, overdoses keep going up. Some of us in here may already know, but for those that don't, I'll speak briefly about it. So, Ocean County, right, 2015, 108, give or take, overdoses, that could be off a couple numbers on that. In 2016, 207, 207. Projected this year, to be up over 300. Now last week I, I talked to the prosecutor's office so numbers could have changed. We're at right around 91 overdose deaths right now. Last year we were, I think we were about 108, 118 right about now. So a slight, slight <laughs> decrease. Point, they're still happening. What are all those numbers have in common? Every one of those numbers is a son, a daughter, a mother, a father, a relative, all those numbers mean something. Up till probably about a couple years ago, give or take a little more than that, heroin dealers, right, our friends, right, the heroin dealers, they would cut your heroin, right, wax hold maybe with baby powder, have some pancake mix, right, pancake mix. Ooh, that was, right, that was the thing. Today's day and age, right, we all know what you're dealing with. Fentanyl, fentanyl, a synthetic narcotic 50 to 100 times stronger than heroin. And that's what they're using because they're, they're getting it cheaper. Most of the heroin that we're seeing today is coming from Mexico. It's probably 90, 95 percent, give or take, of the heroin, Mexico. They're even flying it over, over the wall in drones, right? But they're also getting fentanyl from Mexico much cheaper. And I don't have the exact cost, maybe about the prosecutor to speak about that when it comes up. But fentanyl is a lot cheaper to get out there on the street than heroin. That's why they buy it, that's why they mix it, and your overdose, or your high rather, will be that much better. The problem is, if you're in rehab, right, for a few months, or like Jeff's, Jeff's brother, you know, you're in jail for a few months, and you get out, and your body, per se, was maybe used to doing heroin with baby powder in it, and now you're going to do the same amount, same amount of bags, whether it's 5, 25, whatever you were doing, laced with fentanyl, and your body's not used to it, that's where you're overdosing and dying. Fentanyl, that is a big problem for us. 23 years ago when I started in Lacey Township, the wax full of heroin, 25 bucks. Remember, 20 to 25 dollars. 20 was a good price for the wax full that you can get. Now, $3, $4, $5, right? Much really more available. 
a decrease in price, and you got fentanyl. Prescription drug use. Now, I'm just going to talk briefly about that because Tom Kelly's here from the medicine, medicine to go tonight to speak a little bit about that. But I'll just say, in regard to prescription pills, do I think it increases? Sure, I do. You know, you have a legitimate injury, <coughs> a shoulder surgery, or a back surgery, back injury, whatever, and you get a prescription, Oxycontin, Oxycodone, whatever it might be, and you start taking it. And over time, you start depending on it for the pain, right? But then there comes a day that your doctor or physician is going to say, no more. I'm not prescribing any more Oxys. That's it. You still need them now because you're addicted to them. So what do you do? You might go out first and try to get prescription pills on the street. Last I checked was about a dollar milligrams. So if you're looking at a 40 milligram oxy, 40 bucks. 80 milligram, 80 bucks. Why would you do that? I mean, you'll get a packet of wax full of heroin for five or ten dollars. Do math. And now you're getting that wax bowl mixed with fentanyl. Again, more overdoses. Can I see you raise your hands of so who's here from Lacey Township? Anybody here from Lacey? Okay, a lot, a lot more than last year. Uh, who actually attended overdose awareness today last year? Like I said, prior to that, as a police officer, I primarily dealt with enforcement, right? As a chief of police, I'm like, okay, my main priority of the police department is going to be to decrease the heroin epidemic. So I move some people around, we get things in place, we get a drug unit in place. So I feel confident what Lacey Township is doing in regard to enforcement. Like I said earlier, enforcement has to remain a priority for me People have to be held responsible for the things that they do. That's what we do as police officers, we, we enforce the law. But I learned from being here last year and from people like Donna that there's so much more to this than enforcement, right? Like, we all need to be united. We all need to be on the same team. We need to work together. We started that by being here tonight. But what do I do? I sat down and I'm like, listen, I gotta get past this, this, this drug enforcement. Yes, I still have to do it, it's a priority, but I need to do more. I'm always looking to do, do more in Lacey Township, in Ocean County, and do whatever I can. So I began immediately focusing on education, prevention, treatment, and recovery. Treatment and recovery, we really know too much about, right? Again, when I met Don, we started talking, I started meeting people one after another. Footprints, footprints over there. The point is, immediately I said, as a police chief for Lacey Township, I have to start building the relationship between the police officers and our kids. I just felt like we need to be embedded in the school system and, and try to teach our kids as, as young as we possibly can that this stuff is bad. Now, we never really had um, a full-time school resource officer. I mean, somebody from our other districts might have police officers in their school already. We never had that here. Um, I mean, we were never, really never involved with a dare program or, or anything like that. We did some stuff, you know, going into the school, talk about problem safety, those type of things. But we never really had that drug prevention or type of education in school. So right away, I got on that. I started looking around, and I found a, a, a program called LEAD. They're actually here tonight in the back. Law Enforcement Against Drugs. It's a program that's not the same, but similar along the lines of, of DARE, and they're probably going to, if they want to come up and then say a few words after that, that's fine. Um, but it's something I knew I had to get into the school. We actually began uh, training people this past year, instructors from our police department, including Detective May. We actually went into our one elementary school, Mill Pond Elementary School, and actually taught the LEAD program to the sixth grade kids, which I actually felt was one of the best things that, we, that we've done so far. I just want to turn over briefly to uh, Detective uh, May, who's going to speak about the LEAD program and what actually they did in the schools. Detective May? Hello, everybody. Uh, as the Chief said, Detective May, uh, last year, uh, or earlier this year, uh, Chief Mel, Captain, asked me if I'd be interested in a uh, program that's out there. Uh, I don't know if I to say uh, it's called LEAD program. To be honest with you, I didn't know a lot about it. Uh, after uh, reading into it, uh, in January, I was sent to a uh, course where they pretty much give you all the tools and uh, education that you need to get out there and just be inserted into uh, the school system and, and talk to the, uh, the students and pretty much give them the knowledge 
uh, and information that's out there that they're going to find out one way or another. So why not come from us, a reputable source, that they can say, this is what the officer is saying, you know, this is what it is, this is what's going to happen to me, and here are the results. You can see the video, watch endless, countless amount of uh, stories and statistics about, about all that. So um, we uh, coordinated with the Mill Pond School uh, here in town. And the principal, their, uh, their faculty was great. Uh, Ms. Perez was the, uh, the health, health teacher that uh, we assumed her classes, essentially. So for 10 weeks, we had a pilot program that was set up about, 100 and, uh, about 140 students. And we just started uh, teaching. We, just, yeah, we had a lesson plan, and it went, it went pretty, pretty smooth. So first class, you know, they're all looking at me like, you know, I'm an officer, all the students are, you know, they don't want to raise their hand when they're questioning, or going to shy. And I'll tell you, at the end of, at the end of the 10 weeks, everybody's high five, you know, everybody, I, I kick kids out on the street on their bikes, like, hey, where you going? You know, waiting. So, it's getting out of four, but also, without them maybe realizing it, or what have you, is we're giving them the information that they need to make sound choices, good decisions, and just to, uh, to, to let them know, like, this is what happens. This is, this is reality. Speak to, them, speak to them like adults. Speak to them like adults uh, for a period of time, and, it, and I think that's when it really it really clicks in it, and you get to it for to them, and uh, it made a difference, I, I, I feel. And you know what? If it's just one student, you know, that's pretty good. So. Uh, so we're going to be teaching that uh, for for years to come, you know, and it's really a good program. Thank you, Dr. May. I appreciate that. So as I was stating, one of my like I said, one of my goals right now is to really strengthen that relationship between the police department and the kids, and better ourselves in, in the school. So like I said, Dr. May said we did start teaching the lead this past year. We're going to do it again this year, starting in a few weeks. The summer's already over already. And hopefully next year we'll be able to move it into the middle school as well. Also, it's about a year ago, I started working with our township committee and or our school board, the school district here, to try to bring a full-time officer into the schools, into the high school rather. Again, something that we've really never had, but like I said, my mind's always going, and I'm trying to think of what can, what can I do here, in, at least in Lacey Township, to try to make things better and try to decrease the heroin epidemic, get some education out there. A lot of schools, like I said, a lot of school districts around already have SROs, so pretty much right off the bat, I said, I gotta get a full-time SRO. So after pretty much almost a year of, of negotiations, um, I have to, I'm very proud to sit up here tonight and say, as of tomorrow, we now have our first ever full-time school resource officer here in Lacey County. <laughs> Everything just worked out perfect. Our, our governing body, our, our committee here in Lacey Township, they're absolutely amazing people who work with the mayor, uh, definitely everybody that's on here, all the committee members. And Frank Wheatley, I said earlier, I thought he would be here this evening, but he's our new superintendent. He's been here pretty much since I've been chief about a year. The guy's absolutely amazing. He's all for drug education and, and drug prevention and awareness, and we pretty much hit it off right off the bat. We have a really great relationship, so I think big things will be coming for Lacey Township as far as education and speaking. I'm very happy about that. You know, that brings me on to my recovery education, recovery prevention. I think I talked a little bit about recovery before, so I really didn't know anything about recovery a year ago, right? Like I said, police enforcement is primarily what we did, what I did throughout my career. But since then, I've had the opportunity to work with Ghana and know people in recovery and learn the different side and meet a lot of amazing people. And having her, having that relationship and partnership with her, having her here in Lacey Township is, is, is phenomenal. And again, thank you. I, I appreciate it. So lastly, um, treatment. This is what a prosecutor told you I was paying this buck for the whole year. But they, basically, a uh, prosecutor Coronado, <coughs> about a year last year, began the, uh, what was then was the HARP program. Now it's Blue Heart. And initially it started in Brick and Manchester Townships. And right off the bat, I knew that was the missing link that I needed, right? We had, we had enforcement, education, prevention, treatment, and recovery. I pretty much felt like I had everything except treatment. Now, I had 
tried working with different um, organizations, which everybody was great. And uh, but this was something I kind of felt I needed here in Lincoln Township. So I'll probably tell you, probably almost monthly, right? I was calling you monthly, saying, Prosper, you've got to get us involved with this blue bar program. I need this. I'm very happy to say, thanks to Prosecutor Coronado, Chief Miller. A lot of people in the prosecutor's office, Lacey Township actually is part of the Blue Heart program as of June 26th. So thank you, I appreciate that. Starting the Blue Heart program, like I said, well, we announced the start date to be June 26th, but we actually started about a week earlier. We started having people come in. And I've met a lot of great, great people. And today we've had about nine. Uh, people come in, and folks, I mean, well, some from Lacey, but, you know, for those that live in Lacey, oh, I'm sorry, for those that, that don't live in Lacey, if you live in another municipality, you can come to Lacey Township to seek treatment, right? You don't have to live. Now, the way I set up is we have uh, Lacey Township and um, Ocean Gate on Monday during the day. You can walk at those police departments. I'll get to what the program is. Tuesday, you have staff and township, and then Wednesday, Thursday, you have, you have Rick and you have Manchester. So there's, there's five municipalities on there on the Blue Bar program. Basically what it is is when you come, come to the police department, now like I said, you don't have to live in Lacey, you live in another municipality, Ocean County, it doesn't matter. I'm not going to turn you away. This, this program means a lot to me. When you come in, it's a volunteer, you can volunteer for this program, you can, you can turn in, if you have heroin or other dangerous drugs you want to turn in, bring them in. Not going to get charged and take it and destroy it and so forth. We want people to come. We want to offer you help. So you come in, you sit down. I have one of our detectives assigned. Detective Pierce is assigned to the Blue Heart program. He will meet with you, talk to you, make sure that this is something that they want to do. And then they will bring you to the use of Ocean Mental Health in Bayville. They bring you there, actually, you transport there. And then they will find you a, a place for, for treatment. Like I said, I'm very happy that that we can afford that. Thank you again, uh, Mr. Prosecutor. So that was a five-point plan. That's what we're doing here in Lacey Township. That's been here earlier when I showed you that video. I do this because I want to do everything that I possibly can to decrease this heroin epidemic. It is and will remain my number one priority for Lacey Township. Now, probably about three weeks, two three weeks ago, I had a. Uh, it's not here tonight, but uh, John Magley, I'm not sure if he's here tonight. So about two or three weeks ago, he stopped in um, my office. He's very, he lost his son and, uh, you know, to Maryland. And he's very passionate about what he does. He gets involved and he came in, he said, hey, sat down with me and we talked about different things, including the war. And he said, Chief, listen, we need to do more. And I said, John, listen, I'm constantly trying to find new ways to make things better, not just for Lazy County, but for our county and for our state. He said, I got a book for you. I want you, I want you to read this book. So the book is titled Life After You. Okay, I don't know if anybody's seen this book before. Okay, I'm probably going to butcher the name, so I apologize. But the author is Linda Laterman. Um, and I told him, he said, he said, you have to read this book. It's about a family that lost, you know, son or daughter from, you know, addiction. And I, I, I think it's worth your time to read. I said, okay. Put it down on my desk. So finally, this past weekend, I had the opportunity to read this book. I emailed him back. I should have put the email that I said, but I said to him, wow, that book is absolutely amazing. Everybody should read this book. I, I just couldn't believe, uh, again, learn something new with this book. And I can tell you that our school superintendent actually went out and I think purchased 50 of these. And after reading this book, I sit on the uh, Lacey Municipal Police Foundation, and I'm actually in the process of trying to get those books for us, because when people come into our, our department or my officers have contact with people out on the street, and they think, hey, wait a minute, maybe this book might be worth their reading. Let me tell you, that book is so realistic, and that's how good it is. So I want to thank him for bringing that, that book. That pretty much, um, for me, you know, wraps up my presentation uh, this evening. Uh, like I said to you earlier, it, it, it's caused by everybody, everybody being here. And like I said, a lot of this is new to me, but it, it opened up my eyes to realize that if we are going to decrease this epidemic and, and, and save lives, we really, we really need to, to work together. And I want to thank everybody um, for being here tonight. Thank you.
of Pat Love, a very amazing woman. Okay. She is holding an event next month, the fourth annual Laugh for Recovery Comedy Benefit. September 15th, doors open at 6 o'clock, mm -hmm. and I have a comedy show that starts at 7.30, and it's at the Lamoco Harbor Firehouse on Warren Avenue in Fort River. This will be up here. We ran this information on it for two blocks, purchase tickets. I'm going to be there. It's going to, it's going to be a great night. Go see Donna and young people in recovery for this. I'm going to be here for the remainder of the evening. If anybody would like to come up, if you have any questions to me or what you know, Lacey Township Police Department is doing, or if you have any ideas of things that you think that I can do or my police officers can do to help decrease this heroin epidemic, I want to hear it because I do not know everything. So thank you very much. Enjoy the rest of your evening. prosecutor a little over four years ago, I realized that we had, I had, um, after within, I guess, uh, within a week of becoming a prosecutor, I had eight overdose deaths in seven days, all under the age of 28. I had one young girl who was 18 years old from Brick, a blonde girl who was who died in a motel room, who was doing 50 packs of heroin a day, 25 in the morning and 25 at night, and she died. You know, and as a dad, Father, I said to myself, to my wife, what did I get myself involved in? And the numbers seemed to increase every single time. So as I went through the year 2013, uh, it became apparent to me that in 2012, they had 56 overdose deaths here in Ocean County. Unfortunately, by the end of 2013, we had 112. It actually had doubled. And as a result of that, I knew that we had to do something. And that's when Narcan became available. I will tell you what we did is, and we kind of broke it down into three categories, and Mike really did a tremendous job, but I call it the three blocks. The first block is education and prevention. That means that we need to be embedded in the school system, and I think that's where we really need to throw most of our money, because we need to draw a line in the sand to get into the school and say, wait a minute, this is a path that we don't want to go down. The second block is strong law enforcement, and we need to, to police officers and law enforcement to do what we need to do is to go after the predators, not so much the people who are addicted or as I would call the substance abuse, but the person who are preying on these individuals, okay, and make sure that we put them in jail and that we take care of them the appropriate way. And then the third block is partnering up with the healthcare community to break the cycle of addiction. And I think if you work in all three blocks, just not in one block, but in all three blocks, that's when you can make a difference. So let's go back and take a look at the numbers. When it became apparent to me at the end of 2013 that we were going to double, I turned and I said, oh my God, we gotta do something. And that's when we started looking at Narcan. I'm very proud to say that we were the first county in the state of New Jersey to have Narcan. All the chiefs were on board with me, and we were the first in the year 2014 in law enforcement to use Narcan in the state of New Jersey. What happened with regard to that is that our numbers in 2014 went from previous years of 112 down to about uh, 104. And that was because of Narcan. In 2015, the number went back up to 100 and um, went up to 118. And in 2016, we're up to 207. Now the question really is, why is that going when we're doing these three blocks and we're really, really you know, as I'm calling, really drilling down on it. And that's what Mike really hit on again, it's because of fentanyl. Fentanyl is a synthetic opioid. It's made in a test tube, it's extremely inexpensive, it can be gotten from China, it can be gotten from Russia, and all you need is a little bit of it, okay? As I said, you have just about 40 different types of fentanyl. 
Um, there's carafentanil, um, butanafentanil, um, sinafentanil. There's 40 different types of it. And the fentanyl is at least 100 times more powerful than heroin. And all you need is one little grain, a little grain, just like the salt or sugar, it'll kill an elephant. And the question really is, is that they now know that by putting a little bit of this fentanyl in that packet, that this stuff is absolutely tremendous as far as they're concerned because it's such an opiate, and that's the problem. When we look back at it, in 2014, 10% of these little packets had fentanyl in it. In 2015, 30% of the packets had fentanyl in it. In 2016, it's up to 60% of the had the fentanyl in it. And I'm going to tell you today, when we're starting to take a look at what we have, and I'll give you the numbers as of today, when we looked at 80 of these packets, we saw that about 57 of them had fentanyl. So that's about 65%, 67% of our packets in the first six months of this year had fentanyl in it. And that's why it's out of control. We can't control this anymore, and that's why these numbers are escalating and going tremendously out of, out of control because they're death packets. And you're going to say to me, why would the dealers want to kill their people, right? I mean, that's, you know, my wife asked it. Everybody wants to know why, because they don't care. It's so much cheaper. They can, they can use a little bit of fentanyl, okay? $2,000 worth of fentanyl will yield about $1.5 million, okay? So think about a $2,000 investment that they can take, mix it, distribute it, and get it out because it's all about what we learn in law enforcement is money. That's really what it is. You always want to follow where the money is. So the bottom line is I can spend a lot of time talking about the first block. I can really spend a lot of time talking about the second block, our strict liability and what law enforcement is doing. But I'm really going to talk about today on a positive attitude about the last block breaking the cycle of addiction. And what, we really, what I need to do as a dad, and as your prosecutor, was that I thought was to save lives. And that's why we came out with Narcan. And even Narcan has developed. It actually is stronger today than it was before. The delivery met method is a little better than it was before. That in itself has evolved. But the problem with that is, is that people are going <laughs> to say, wait a minute, you're taking this person, you know, they're going to call a drug addict. I call it substance abuse person has a substance use, it's a disease, and they truly, truly believe that it is, and they can say you're saving their life only to go back out and to steal again and to do it all over again. So I knew that there needed to be another part of it, that Narcan itself was not going to save the death. We may save that life for a minute, we may have saved that life for that individual today, I know that Jeff talked about his brother, we saved his life by using Narcan. But that was not breaking the cycle of addiction, right? That's not going to break the cycle of addiction. So what we really need to do is to get him into the hospital, make sure that anybody that law enforcement gives Narcan to is presented to the hospital. And that's when we started the ARC program, which is the overdose, opiate overdose response program. That means that any individual that gets sprayed by law enforcement has to be brought to the hospital, has to be brought to the emergency room, and there is where a recovery coach, individuals like, like John Brogan and Angela Cicchini and some of the other individuals that we have go there and they work 24 hours a day, seven days a week. They go into the emergency room and I call, they capture those individuals and try to tell them, look, you almost walked into the light, you almost died. Now you need to go to a detox and get you into treatment. We were the first county to do it in the state of New Jersey. Again, we've been the leaders with Narcan, we've been the leaders with the ART program, and now again, as Narcan has spread throughout the whole uh, throughout uh, the state of New Jersey, the ART program has now spread throughout the state of New Jersey. Not every county has it, but every county wants it. And now, you, when you go to a hospital that you can spray with Narcan, there's going to be a recovery coach, and hopefully, we're going to convince that individual at that point in time to get treatment and to, to hopefully break the cycle of addiction. That program has been successful. We're not successful in every single instance, but I will tell you, the rates of success are much, much better as a result of what's happened with regard to that. But then I start thinking that way. If we arrest them and we put them in jail, we can get them help. If they overdose and they almost die, I can get them help. 
we need to do something else, and that's the Blue Heart Program. And that's what Mike was talking about. Now you can go to a police station. And I want you to think about this. We launched this program on January 11th of this year. Again, the first county in the state to do it. And you can walk into a police station on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. And so far, about 210 people have walked into that police station and that we've got them into the system. If you walk into Lake Sea or Ocean Gate on Monday, you're going to go to Ocean Mental Health. So you're going to clinically analyze. And based on that clinical diagnosis, we're going to get you into a detox facility, and then we're going to get you into a treatment facility. If you walk into, uh, if you walk in on a Tuesday down in Stafford Township, again, it's going to be Ocean Mental Health that's going to be doing it there. If it's on a Wednesday, it's going to be Manchester, and it's going to be Integrity House. And the police then take it to Integrity House. They're clinically analyzed. Yesterday we had five individuals. We got slammed. We had five individuals that walked into Manchester yesterday that we now got into detox today and that they're now going to be going into, into a treatment facility once they get done. And on a Thursday, it's preferred behavioral health up and, up and break. Now the answer is this. Why don't I do it in every single of the 33 municipalities that we have here? I don't have the detox beds. I don't have the treatment facilities. I don't have the back end of it. Not that I don't want to do it. Of course we would want to do it. But I'll blow my system up. I gotta crawl before I walk. I gotta walk before I run. The system that we're doing works. It's tremendous. But it's not, it's not, it's not a system that I think I can roll out throughout the entire state of New Jersey. But what I want to do is roll it out throughout the country. I need to get the hospital's attention. I need to be able to bring them into the hospitals. I'm working with the Meridian system, I'm working with the Barnabas system, and hopefully down the road, the partnership that law enforcement is doing with the hospital system, we will be able to deliver these people not to Integrity House, not to, not to uh, Preferred, not to uh, Ocean Mental Health, but deliver them to the emergency room, have them handle it the right way, okay? Be able to have the back end of it, the detox facilities that we need, the treatment facilities that we need to really make a difference. That's not going to happen overnight. There's bureaucracy steeped with it. There's money issues. There's HIPAA issues. There's a thousand different things, but we will get it done. I'm dedicated to try to make a difference to do it. I am blessed that I have uh, Sergeant Renee Narwoods here, who is Renee is great. She has been, she's been with me from day one. She's going to be able to tell her story. The bottom line is I know that, it, it, again, as Mike said, it's not about we're not going to arrest our way out of this problem. But I truly am dedicated to these three blocks. That is education and prevention, strong law enforcement, and breaking the cycle of addiction. Now let's say one other thing. The one thing here, the reason why I have John Brogan and why I love recovery coaches and the reason why I think it makes a difference is that we need to marry these people. Needs to, there needs to be a mentoring system. They need to partner up from day one. When they go into detox, when they go into, when they go into treatment, and when they eventually go into a sober living or to a halfway house, you need a live human being that's going to follow them all the way through. They need that lifeline. You just can't have a soft handle. And that's the one thing I like about our programs. We have accountability. We track it. Every person who comes into our Blue Heart program, every week I get a report where they are, what they're doing. I want to find out why they're successful and why they're not successful. What's important to me is outcomes. I'm not going to give a soft hand walk. I'm not just going to take somebody and put them into treatment and walk away. I want to know how they're doing in treatment. I want to know what they're doing after treatment. I want to know where they're going because I want to be embedded, because if I get that individual to be a viable member of society, my job is that much easier. I believe 85% of our crime comes from drugs. And if I'm, going to, if I'm going to address crime and make a difference in this county, I have to do this 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Not only will I reduce the crime, we're going to save lives. And how great is that to make a difference? So, uh, I can go on and on and on. I'm honored to be here. I can't thank Don enough. I can't thank the people who, who work with me side by side. 
The bottom is, the bottom line is, if we're able to make a difference in one person's life, then we have succeeded. I thank you all for being here, and I appreciate it. Renee? Well, here she is. Renee, Renee has, as I indicated, she's a sergeant in my juvenile section. She has been, she was there before I was, obviously. She educated me in many, many instances. She's been in the school system. I know that her and Rory Wells, who's an assistant prosecutor, they pretty much they spend all their time in the schools, dedicated to the schools. Uh, and you know, like like they say, you know, every man has a successful woman behind it. Renee's the individual that, that, that keeps me going. So, Renee, thank you so much. <laughs> Today, 
is struggling tremendously, and it has been 30 years of the world to ride. You know, and it's to the point now where it may sound callous, but you know, we're we're wondering, okay, what do we think about how we're going to pay for the funeral? Which is a terrible thing. You should never have to think that about a loved one. You know, you don't want to give up. You never want to give up. But I'm here to tell you that sometimes you have to love a little bit from a distance. You have to set an example because if you keep doing what you do, because you, you can't love them out of it, okay? you can't pray them out of it, that doesn't work. You can't, you know, make yourself broke like Jeff said, you know, people mortgage their homes, they everything. And not only that, there's other children a lot of times, there's six of us in my family and 14 grandchildren. And there's one person that has managed to move up dearly. You make the whole family crazy, pretty much. Like, it affects every person in the family. Every holiday, everything that you do. Because you don't really feel joy when the one that you love is no longer with you. Or they're out using and an acting with you. You know, and they can't come to Christmas because they're not allowed at someone's house because they're still using, or they can't go to Thanksgiving. You know, you're constantly reminded of that. So for the people that are here that are family members, you have to take care of yourself some more. You really have to learn to take care of yourself. And there's some really good friends in the room. I don't know if Nancy's still here or she left, but you know, it, sometimes it takes years to learn how to do that. And you can love them, sometimes you need to love them from a distance. And sometimes, you know, we had the benefit at one time to when people got arrested, they would stay in jail for a little bit. And sometimes their first initial contact with jail is enough to turn them around. I actually had my niece locked up. That is not cool. I didn't do it because I'm a law enforcement officer and I wanted to lock her up. I did because I knew where she was. It was the first time I actually could get him to sleep. I laid my head on the pillow, not worried about the phone ringing, because I knew where she was, and she was safe. And I <coughs> told anyone in my family, if any of you bail her out, don't ever come to my house again. By the grace of God, like I said, no one bails her out the first time, and she got into treatment, and she's fine. So what I want to say to you, because sometimes you know, this disease is cunning. You know, you think, you think they have it, and hopefully you send them off to rehab, they come home, and you know, you're like, oh, they've got it this time. And you're hopeful. <coughs> Everyone is so hopeful. And there is hope. There is hope. But as parents and as loved ones, some of the things that you should be looking for, and I'm not, you know, treatment is one thing, but there's a difference between treatment and recovery. Treatment is you, you get them, you send them off, you know, they get their detox, they get their residential, they get a little eye opening knowledge but not enough to make it in the real world when they come out that's when the hard stuff begins so if you're a parent or a loved one recovery should look like your kids going to meetings them talking about having a sponsor um, going to a home group and John can help me I'm not in recovery better be humble so much um, going to a home group and having commitments and giving back when you see your loved one, your child, whoever is in recovery, actually giving back, going to events, going to, going to sober events, that's when you know they're really beginning to start to recover. But at the same time, you need to recover. Because for so long, that person robbed you of your joy. And when they see you doing well, you're like their best example. Still, parents, you know, they always say that your child's best role model is the parent. You know, when they see you starting to do well and better in life, you know, you need to model that behavior. Um, like I said, you know, I think, like Mike developed in the back, Chief developed, this is probably the most rewarding part of my career. You know, it's hard putting yourself out there, but I don't care. I'm at the age now, I don't care, I'm too old. And, um, and it really doesn't, I'm not ashamed. I'm not ashamed to that I have addiction in my family, and I'm not ashamed that to come out, speak to people. I'm surrounded by good people here, 
and I just want to say thank you for the opportunity to come out and speak to you about this topic. If you have any questions, I'll be here as well. by the people, it was the greatest honor I ever had that happened in November of 2013. Other than my daughter being born, I'm very, very grateful for that, and I hope that it continues for many years. But one of, and that's one of the places in my life where I identify. But I will tell you this, one of the other places that I identify in my life is what I did before politics, and what I will continue to do afterwards. The county, I'm the director of the Ocean County Intoxicated Driver Resource Center. I see what a lot of the folks here are talking about. Now, I'm an administrative director. Anybody that gets a DUI comes through the program. But I don't do the heavy lifting. Our police department, the traffic units around the county, our prosecutor, these are the people that supervise and see the fatalities. And what happens on the road? When we drive, when people are under the influence, it is not only giving me a healthy fear of misuse of prescription drugs and alcohol, but it's given me a healthy hatred of it. And over the years, I guess I've developed in that hate for underage drinking and drug abuse because I see what it does to the kids. And it is most unfortunate. It's a great honor to know and work with some of the people in this room. And I will tell you, in 1986, when I graduated high school, there were no programs like this at all. Now, Ocean County has taken the lead under the guidance of our prosecutor, chiefs like Chief Bella, his colleagues, traffic units around the county, and all of our municipalities. I give them the credit for keeping us safe. I do believe that driving is one of the most dangerous things we do in our daily lives. I think with texting now, it's another avenue to take that one exponent far. It's been said that if you want to kill a tree, you start at the roots. I think the prosecutor and the chief realized that if you want to cultivate a tree, you start at the roots too. But for their efforts in education, dovetailing with enforcement in our schools, all our municipalities, and now outreach into the faith-based community, in different townships, different churches, different types of religions, uh, now in public health as well. You know, we had traditionally in public health, we're tasked with things like flu shots, food inspections. And we have a public health coordinator in the county now who over the last several years realizes that the opiate epidemic is costing lives, and it's more than worth our time. <coughs> we partner up, we get out of our silos, where I would just do administrative work. I'm fortunate enough to go out into some high schools now and talk to young people. Captive audiences, 400 at a click. But for the efforts of the prosecutor, it was good enough to send some of those investigators out with me. Um, my, my program, it certainly wouldn't resonate as much. It's really his program. So I thank him for that publicly as I have thanked him privately. The efforts of Chief Bella and all the people in this room, our <coughs> municipal alliance, the take home point is if nobody does it alone, we stand shoulder to shoulder and we're vested in this fight because we all have skin in this game. I think Renee just said she has a 12 year old son. I didn't know that. I have a 12 year old daughter. I want to be there for her. And a little bit of self-disclosure for me, 11 days ago, I was at the beach. I was at Orly Beach with her. She jumped on my back. She weighs about 100 pounds now. I twisted the, 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 the God, the be Jesus out of my knee. I went to the uh, orthopedic, and the orthopedic had said, would you like a prescription? I said, absolutely not. I'll limp however long it takes. So I get the MRI. I'm waiting for the results. But I have such a fear of that medication that I will not take it. I will not take it. 
So I want to thank everybody that's in our schools, that's doing the paperwork, that's doing the horrible, awful work of recreating a traffic accident with its fatalities with babies and baby seats. I know my limits. I'm a tough guy. I'm, I, I try to be a stand-up mayor for you. I know that if I had to go and recreate a scene like that and pull the deceased out of a twisted metal coffin that just a couple hours ago was taking a happy family to a beach or an event or a prom, I couldn't do it. I'm 49 years old. We have very little more to lose than our future. I come up here in front of you tonight with no prepared words or statements. I'm not reading off the dummy card. It's easy to talk about this because it comes from the heart. I don't want to see another young person lost, okay? To me, a young person in high school or an innocent baby is much more valuable than my life. They have an entire future. I want to see them experience the things that I had and the things that I did and the blessings that God gave me. I want to see them see tomorrows. And I don't want to see them abused with underage drinking, the misuse of prescription drugs. I'm very, very grateful to stand shoulder to shoulder with the people in this room. People know I'm accessible. If you have questions, please ask me, our Deputy Mayor, our Chief, Pastor Applegate, our Municipal Alliance, the Lacey School System, and our Prosecutor. Thank God for our Prosecutor, I'm going to tell you. I, I hope he stays with us. He has redefined that position. We're very grateful to have him and all the people in the room to help keep our kids safe. Thank you and God bless. I apologize, John Brogan. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. My name is John Brogan. I'm a very grateful person who wants to be here. I, um, first and foremost, everyone who's lost someone to the disease of addiction, my prayers and uh, my thoughts are with you. Um, I can't identify with the pain that you feel. The only thing that we can offer is, is our prayers and support. Um, you know, I, I can tell you my story from the perspective of a, a kid that grew up in a divorced family. Um, I can tell you my story from the perspective of uh, going into the Marine Corps and coming home from, from a lot of different perspectives, but none of that has anything to do with the reason why I'm an alcoholic or a drug addict. Um, I'm an alcoholic and addict because I suffer from mental obsession followed by a physical compulsion rooted in a broken spirit. And um, until that was addressed, I had no shot at recovery or, or anything. Um, as soon as I walked in the room tonight, I, I saw George. Um, George was a, a gentleman that picked me up for many years uh, when I was struggling. Um, I would come in, I, I was not unique, you know, I would come into meetings in the local area uh, when I came up from the Marine Corps and um, you know, I would do 90 meetings in 90 days, 30 meetings, you know, tell the parents and go to meetings and. Um, right off the wagon. And, uh, I, you know, I would get what they were trying to tell me, you know, and, and these people really, really meant well. Um, giving of their time to pick me up and, you know, buy me a cup of coffee and buy me a meal, but I hadn't addressed what the issue was. And so many times I would be sitting with George and he would be like, John, you gotta get in the steps. You, you gotta do something. Um, after I left George that last time, um, I got on my last run. Um, you know, it was the summer of 2010. Uh, my wife and kids were gone. And, um, you know, I ended up overdosing four times in that summer. Um, and, it, and it was so routine. And any of the family members that are in here, um, several family from our family members from our family group are here. And, you know, um, this is the identification part. You know, we do it like it, it's just a matter of fact. You know, it happened. It was the cost of doing business kind of thing. And I would get up the next day and I'm still here. Um, in November 2010, I tried to take my own life. 
Um, I had had enough. And uh, the actual action of taking my own life or attempting to wasn't the worst part. The worst part was the weeks leading up to it. The worst part was the thinking about it. It was the, you know, just wanted to throw my car off the road, you know, or, uh, you know, how, how am I going to do this anymore? Just, I, I couldn't get through. It was hopeless. You know, I, I, all the cars read zero. And um, I was on probation, um, like any good addict. I don't go to probation, but I'm an active addiction. Um, so I had some warrants out for me. And I came home um, after trying to take my own life, and um, I went back to mom's house. And uh, the sheriff's officer came that week, and um, you know I went into court, and um, you know right in front of I'm gonna forget Judge Hodgson, and um, I told him I needed help. I was ready. You know I, I didn't want to go through this anymore. And um, he asked me if I was clean, and at that point I had like a you know been like five or six days since I had, you know injected any cocaine or heroin, so in my mind I was clean, but I had also been smoking marijuana every day. So I said, yes, I was the marijuana. And he took me into custody. And he probably saved my life. Because um, I was just, I was incapable of having any sort of life, any sort of coping. The problem is, is, you know, my mind is, is my worst enemy. My mind centers in a broken spirit, and it just becomes routine for so long uh, of the way that I've run my life. You know, I'll cheat, I'll take from you, I'll do whatever I can, you know, just to get that next fix because the drugs and the alcohol are actually treating what's wrong with me. That was what I had wrong. I thought it was the alcohol, I thought it was the drugs were the problem. I, you know, if I could just arrange certain things, if I could just get this situation right in my life, the right job, the right situation, it would work out. The problem was I just kept landing in the same jackpot over and over again. Um, right before Christmas, um, you know, the judge had given me a break and let me out. And um, I can remember, like, I was in there for about, I guess it was 45, 50 days. And um, I, I was so pumped up to do it this time. Like, I, I was really going to do it. And anyone that's got a loved one, you know, that sits in county for a little while, and, you know, I'm really, really going to do it this time. And um, it was right before Christmas. Uh, you know, they, they opened the doors, and my brain just spun right around. Um, the way I would measure myself is when I would walk in a room in active addiction, you were the biggest piece of crap I'd ever met, but I was a little bit lower than that. And that was my measuring step in life. And um, so I come out, and uh, I hit the, hit the doors, and I walk up the street from county, and there's a little adoration chapel at the St. Joe's um, where I grew up in that parish. And, there's a little payphone, or not payphones, it's like one of the old phones on the wall that I knew was there. And I walk up the street and my mind just flipped around when I walked. I had gone from going to take on the world and going to do the right thing this time to it's Christmas, I don't have my daughters, I don't have my wife, no money, no Christmas presents, and couldn't really go anywhere with my sister's house. And um, so my sister came to pick me up, went to my sister's house, and um, she needed to do. I wasn't going to do drugs this time, but, you know, I didn't want to get in any trouble. But I got drunker than I had ever been before. Woke up um, through Christmas, drinking the whole weekend, um, and uh, that Monday morning, got up, called my probation officer, and I said I drank over the weekend, and I was scared. You know, this four horsemen were on my back. Bewilderment, fear, desperation, hopelessness, they were on me like never before. I really did not want to use again. Um, and I called the probation officer. She said, listen, John, if you get into treatment, I will not violate. And I, like everyone knows, there's no insurance. You know, the VA is out in Bedminster. I, I really don't have a ride. I, I can't get anywhere, you know. Um, and I went to a meeting that night, and it just so happened that someone was graduating in Salvation Army in Trenton. And this is really where I start to put the pieces together in my life like that, that I really can't see at this point, only in retrospect. And. Um, he says, John, there's a place that I can probably get you into. And I'm like, yeah, I got court, and you know, I'm probably going to get another warrant. And I don't know, there's another court to really respect this place. Um, there's probably nothing like you've ever been to. Um, but if you get there and you call your probation officer, uh, you know, I'll bet you, you know, they'll probably be easy on you. I was willing to do anything at that point, and um, I, I, through a series of events, it took two days. He said, listen, you're going to call the first day, they're going to tell you you don't have any beds. They're trying to test your willingness. You gotta come over the clean urine. 
So I called the first day, he told me out. I called the second day, he said, get here within two hours. And uh, my brother-in-law drove me, and um, that was in December um, of that year, um, of 2010. I uh, went there for three months, and I did what I had always done. I programmed well. Um, they had a big book study and, and, and a step study going at the place, and I, I would get in, and I would get my weight up, and everything would be feeling good, but I wasn't going in too, too deep. You know, I was focusing on just getting my kid back and getting the wife back. Not listening to what they were saying, which is selfishness and self-centeredness, that's the root of my problem. And, and the alcohol and the drugs, they treat what's wrong with that. And until I do some selfless things that were presented in those steps, I had no shot at life. And until I would get with that, no shot. And so I was there, uh, March 17th, a um, series of events happens. My wife and my kids don't show up for me. And uh, I do what I always do, and um, life's not going my way, and I take off in the train. Um, I come back two days later. They usually don't let you back in. Um, it was March 19th, 2011. That's my sobriety date. And um, they let me back in, and they usually don't do that. And she said, John, you, um, I was dirty. So they said, you got to go home for a day and uh, clean out, and we'll let you back in if you come back with a clean urine. And uh, that's exactly what I did. And I came back and I jumped into that book and I jumped into the steps like I never had before. Um, you know, I was tired of being tired. And uh, everything was zero. There was nothing left. It was just kind of me, God, the steps, and the Salvation Army. And I, uh, it, my life, the freedom inside, that, that bondage of self that we talk about, started little by slowly to get relief. I had to go back in front of the judge. Um, I had to face the judge and let him know everything that happened. I was so scared that morning, but I just done my first four step, and I sit down in front of it, I go in front of the judge that morning, and people were telling me, listen, if you have to go to prison, it's your job now to help guys in prison. That's not really something I was, like, happy about. It was, that was what I was being told. And um, I go before the judge and judge Hodgson, go back and I want you to keep doing exactly what you're doing. And I did. And, um, my life since then is, I can't even begin to tell you where I'm at, you know. It has nothing to do with monetary things. Um, today I have my children back. Um, I'm back with my wife. Um, I, those things are all great, but they mean nothing if I had no program of recovery. The, uh, the program that we're talking about, we had launched with uh, Prosecutor Coronado, and Governor Christie likes to take credit for it, but, um, you know, we launched the overdose program. Before that, we had the jail program. Um, just helping individuals that were just like us sitting in a box, not knowing where to go. Um, and it took a prosecutor and, and a sergeant down there to really be like, okay, let's look at this case individual by individual, you know, and putting them in places where they can be set up for success. You know, 14 days, 30 days, does that work? Um, the results are the results. You know, you can't argue with them. They need a long-term continuum of care. I was in the Salvation Army for 10 months. It, there's no argument there, you know? And um, for a long time, you know, we got a little pushed back, and then we started the Blue Heart Program. I think we're around 207, 210 people that we've helped this year. 210 people turning themselves into the police station to get out. Usually, people that have legal issues, like myself, you think about the psyche of that. That's someone that really, truly wants help. You're not going to a police station just to kind of get off. So, you know, um, today where we're at, I mean, just looking in the room, you know, Mr. Cordino, Marzario, Vance, Spader, the Rileys are here. You know, these are all families that have kids that are in the long-term recovery now. You know, that have a shot at life, that we're in the same spot. Can't argue with results. Can't argue with long-term recovery. And in all the places that we do use, they're all surrounded about that long-term, holistic, non-medicated approach. And it works, it still works. It started in 1935, the book came out in 39, and it's been working ever since. So, um, you know, the thing is for me, I have three daughters as well, and I am blessed beyond anything I could have ever imagined in my life. I, I am grateful every single day when I wake up. But these kids are dying at a rapid rate. And there's a lot of ideas out there, and there's a lot of people selling things, and these are people's souls. You know, the population that we work with, 
They're real addicts. They're indigent. You know, how many people in here have addicts as kids or relatives? Raise your hand. How many of those addicts have insurance? There's your answer. How do you help that? You gotta brand them, you gotta love them. And you gotta show them a way that works. And you gotta walk with them side by side. And you gotta give them purpose. That's the only way we found that works. We're open to other ways, but you know, this thing is not getting any easier. Every single day, it's a new list. Every single day, it's a new person, and it's someone that you know. So the hope is, you know, we do, we are tracking 72 individuals um, that are in long-term recovery, that have their lives back. Um, they are in long-term recovery. It's been started since the Blue Heart program. Um, it's awesome, it's why we come in. Um, they go into treatment and recovery, and the families come to the family group. We have a family group on Thursday nights, uh, 108 Indian Head Road in Tom's River. Um, the families come in and they start to heal. You know, and they get the stuff off their chest that they need to. This is a family disease, and we have to come together in order to combat this thing. So, again, thank you everyone for being here, and uh, thank you for having me. I'm wondering, what's going to happen to this person? 
So when I get a family in, and generally the very first experience a teenager has with an opiate is with a tooth extraction. In fact, that's, it is, that is the, their very first experience is with that. And the parents will bring the prescription in, they'll get it filled, you know, 12. If it's, good, if it's a good doctor, 12. Sometimes I see six, which is even the best. Occasionally I'll see 30. And to my dismay, I just, I'll go out there and I'll have a conversation with the parent and I'll say, listen, give that young man and young lady one tablet at a time. Make sure there's tears coming out of their eyes before you give that tablet. And even then, I'm not sure I give that tablet. Because there's studies that show if you give one ibuprofen, which is Advil, and one Tylenol, which is uh, acetaminophen, give them together, the pain relief is better than that of any prescription opiate. So keep that in mind. One Tylenol and, and one ibuprofen is more effective than any opiate on the market. So I'll encourage that parent, say, listen, try not to give that medication, uh, and, and because you may have some challenges down the road that no matter how much pain your child's in now, it's a whole different story to kind of pain that the entire family and that child's going to experience one, two, three years down the road. Um, I'll also uh, let them know that uh, you know, when you're done with that medication, make sure you dispose the balance at the police department, the David Dropbox. Um, the, uh, you never want to keep any prescription medications uh, that are controlled that have any, any opiates or similar products like that in medicine cabinet. Because if you do, our youth and, 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 and young adults uh, are just incredibly tempted by that bottle sitting in a medicine cabinet. I equate it personally to keeping a loaded revolver in a medicine cabinet. It's more dangerous than that. Because a child probably would be kind of hesitant to pick up a loaded gun. But to pick up a prescription bottle to tackle in it, boy, look at I just scored it for my friends. And when that child gets that tooth extraction, trust me, they're going to get three, four, five, eight text messages from their friends. By the way, what did you get? Can you bring it to the party this Saturday? So you have to make sure that you secure those medications and please dispose of them after, after the fact. And, um, and God bless you all. And uh, thank you for inviting me. Enjoy it. I joined a 12-step group and got involved from the start. 
I learned to trust God, I clean house, and I do my best to help others. I learned recovery isn't just not doing substances anymore, it's much more. It's about changing the person I was. I'm learning a new way of life. I began my recovery process with an open mind and an open heart. Because of that, I've experienced a complete change of perspective on life. Recovery is possible. My recovery is contingent on my spiritual care daily. Like a friend of mine says, I recovered from the gunshot wound, but I'm not bulletproof. It takes work, but it's such a wonderful way of life. I'm truly blessed to be on this journey I'm on. My life today is amazing. I have rebuilt relationships with friends and family. I've completed probation and all my legal obligations. I've paid my financial debts, and I no longer have youth and family services in my life. I have three beautiful kids who I get to take care of. I have a wonderful husband who I get to be with. I have an amazing life I get to be present for. I have peace in my life today. I am beyond grateful for all the changes and everything I've learned about about myself through my recovery journey, and to have a powerful God working in my life. Through Him, all things are possible. We bless you all and good night.
can't seem to remember things. And he puts me on ADHD medication. I felt like I found a miracle drug. I could stay up on my own study. I retained a lot more information than what I was able to do before. And before I knew it, I was abusing this prescription medication. I don't think I wanted anybody to know that I was abusing it because I was afraid of what they would think of me because I'd always been the perfect child. So before I could reach out for help, I was more ashamed than anything. And that began a whirlwind of problems in my life. Before I knew it, I felt so bad about myself that I was starting to get into abusive relationships. We tend to attract people that we feel are equal to ourselves. And I had so, such a low self-esteem, even though I was accomplishing all these wonderful things, that I needed somebody and I became codependent. I believed that I needed to get outside myself and completely deal with somebody else's problems so that I didn't have to look at my own. That led to me becoming pregnant with a person that was very abusive. And I'm still in college at this time. I'm still a great student. And I'm I was about 24 when this happened. So I had stopped abusing the medications that I was prescribed and devoted my life to my pregnancy and my child at that point. I I had my daughter, I continued going to school. I was overdue and still in class. When she was first born, I was taking online classes. And when she was about six weeks old, I began bringing her to class with me. I was diving into my studies in order to get out of the reality of what I was doing at home. It wasn't too long after that I picked up the prescription Adderall and started abusing it again. When my daughter was about a year old, I decided I was going to get out of that relationship for her sake. Not for my own. I thought such, so little of myself at that point, I, I had to put, still codependent, just look at her. So I left the relationship, and I couldn't handle my reality. I couldn't handle failing at everything that I was trying to do. I felt like I was a bad mother. I had no money, I was asking everybody for handouts, I was trying to bartend at night in order to make a living and still go to school. I started to become debilitated. I could not get out of bed. I was unable to care for my daughter the way I wanted to. I was completely started failing at school, getting asked, which I'd never gotten before. So I decided to drop out of school at that point with only nine credits to um, a double bachelor's, which are still outstanding at this day, but we'll get there <laughs> at some point. Um, I had no control out of my life. And I started self-medicating with cocaine at that point. It wasn't my drug of choice, but it helped me get through the little bit of things that I needed to get through the depression started to get even worse. And then I started dating somebody else with a substance use disorder that was addicted to prescription pain medication. And that was the first time it got introduced into my life. Um, I was still very close with my family. I could support, they were supporting me. They had no idea what was going on and how much this had progressed forward. But to me, I had found the perfect little blue pill that made me feel wonderful, got me out of bed, I was able to care for my daughter, I had energy, the depression wasn't painful anymore. And I tried to keep control over that, but it became an obsession. It became an obsession of feeling better, getting out of this reality of mine that was absolutely horrible. I was living in a nightmare. I was still dealing with the abusive father on the sidelines. And I had 
like I said, no control over what I was doing. I felt like a machine at that point. There was one time I couldn't find the pain pills, and somebody gave me my first bag of heroin. When I look back now, I feel like I blinked my eyes and my life passed me by. From that one, it became one every single day. Within a week, I was, I knew I was doing something wrong. I was educated. I, my associate's degree was in elementary psychology. I was taught about drugs and how they affect your brain. And my parents had always been very, I was always supervised. I wasn't allowed to wear nail polish until I was like 15 years old. You know, my dad was very, very strict. I was brought up Catholic. I knew what I was doing was wrong. But the pain was so bad inside that I continued to do as much as I could to try to cover that pain and take care of the responsibilities I needed to take care of. So I started going to a 12-step program almost immediately where, again, I got myself into another bad relationship with somebody with um, a heroin addiction. And believing that we could stay sober together and be a support system, what they tell you in these 12-step programs is not to date for the first year. And I wish I would have taken the advice of so many people at that point. So the next two years, I fought myself in my addiction. I wanted to get clean. I you know, attempted medically assisted treatment of Suboxone, and it, it wasn't working for me. I tried going to 12-step programs. I could only get a day at a time. I was deteriorating. My family had started to cut me off. They, at this point, knew something was going on, but didn't know exactly what. I couldn't get clean until I hit my rock bottom. And even once I hit my rock bottom, it went even further down before I actually decided that I needed to get myself into treatment. I had no house. I was in an abusive relationship, but you think, why don't you walk away if you want to get clean? Well, that person kind of becomes your teammate. What you don't have, they have, and what they don't have, you have, and you start to work together to, you know, get what your ultimate goal is. And you feel like you can't be separated from that person because nobody else would want you at that point. You feel so disgusted with yourself and so little about the decisions that you're making that you ultimately feel that that's the only person in the world that cares about you and in actuality they don't care about you at all. You know, I get my first criminal charges. I lose custody of my six-year-old. Well, at that time she was four. I lose custody of her only one month after her father ultimately dies of no dose. So my six-year-old wakes up, finds her, daughter, her dad asleep on the couch, and he doesn't wake up. I get custody of my daughter. A month goes by, I lose my house. I realize at this point I can't take care of her. I give her to my mom because I feel like this is the best decision. And I still have to step in and remove custody from me because they find out about my use. Um, I felt completely worthless, hopeless. I had no support system whatsoever. I stole from my family. I did all of these awful things that you hear that people in active addiction do. I was not myself. I was a completely different person, and that's what this drug does to you. It completely changes your brain chemistry in order for you to obsess about a substance that is going to make everything better. But in actuality, in the grand scheme of things, it's just making everything so much worse. So I, uh, I feel like I'm at my bottom. I'm homeless, I'm childless, I have nothing, no family around me. But yet I still dive deeper into my addiction. I would sleep on couches, do whatever I could to get by. And I finally get into my first treatment program. You would think at this point I was ready. Yeah, I dove in. I was the best student. Like I had always been. I went through detox. I went through a 28-day rehab. I graduated great. I signed myself up for an IOP. 
and I get myself into an Oxford house. Well, within two weeks of being at that Oxford house, I found an old prescription of um, Clonopin, and of course I take it. Well, if you know about Oxford houses, you're not allowed to take any substances. And I get kicked out. They can't prove that I did it, so I get accepted into another Oxford house. I live there for two weeks before I relapse on an old prescription of Suboxone and get kicked out. Now I'm homeless again, I'm jobless, and I'm almost back right where I started. So what do I do? I go back to the boyfriend. It's, it's repetitive, it's, it, it's complete insanity, and when you're in it, you don't see it. You feel like the next decision you're making is the right one, what you don't understand is you can't make your own decisions for yourself in the beginning. You literally need somebody to take your hand. So my relapse lasted about two months before I really decided I was done. I was ultimately completely done. I had to wait for the boyfriend to get arrested so that I could get away. I tried to get into a rehab and I couldn't. It wasn't the insurance, it was just availability of beds. So I called my sister, my sister picked me up. Oh, I, I did three French knives, three sisters who were all very supportive of me, um, but had completely cut me off at this point in my addiction. So I called the one that I feel like would help me, and she did, she came out and picked me up. And I get, a chance to do something. So I have to, I'm sorry, I lost my train of thought. <laughs> um, okay. So because I couldn't get into a bed, I couldn't get into a rehab, the only option for me was to put myself into the hospital through the crisis unit to tell them that I was gonna harm myself, which in all actuality, I was at that point. I was completely helpless, hopeless. I was a, a shell of myself. So I, submit, I get myself into the, uh, what used to be called Shoreline, now I think it's St. Barnabas Healthcare System. I spend 11 days in their crisis unit where they get me on to Boston in order to treat my withdrawal and to help me start to cope with recovering. I'm still homeless, my family won't give me anything, and coming from somebody that's in recovery, my family cutting me off my mom wouldn't even give me a peanut butter and jelly sandwich at this point in my recovery. It was probably the, the straw that broke the camel's back and actually made me decide to get help. If my mom had helped me even a little bit, it would have prolonged my use, even if it was just another day, because I was able to eat that day, where if, if she hadn't, she would feed me, I couldn't eat. So even though it was thing that you think might be helping, is in a way enabling the children to progress their addiction a little bit further and their use. So I think that's something that's very important to know. But they, they talk about the enabling and how hard it is, but this is coming from a person's mouth. If you have a loved one that's in addiction, in active use, you have to do everything you can and know it will be hard, but to cut yourself off from them. They have to make this decision on their own. So I spent 11 days at St. Barnabas Inpatient Crisis Center, and they want to release me to the Hoboken Homeless Shelter. No cell phone, no car, no family, no money, no nothing. I was completely thrown back. What do you think I'm going to do at the Hoboken Homeless Shelter with nothing, no money, and 11 days clean? This was going to jeopardize my recovery, and I knew it. They're telling me I'm not being compliant, and I know that I want to do anything I can at this point to save my sobriety so that I can start to build my life back. I had not talked to my daughter at this point for about three months. I had completely separated myself, and I know it was breaking her heart, but I couldn't let her see me like this. So I tell them I have a place to go. And I pretty much got dropped off, and my sister brings me at 10. For four days, I stayed in Alaire State Park in the middle of June. In the, in the heat, 
There's hardly any food with anything, but the only thing I knew was that I did not want to use again, that I was done, and I was going to do whatever I had to do to stay clean. It was not easy, I'm not going to lie to you. It was, it was very difficult at this point. And the days drag on. So at the end of four days, I was really struggling with staying sober. And I put myself back into St. Barnabas for another four days. It was then I got kind of a miracle opportunity to go to a program called Crosswinds. It's a respite center, which pretty much deals with people that need help with medication man management and mental crisis. So I spent 10 days there trying to make, so, now this is the first 30 days of my recovery, trying to make any bit of amends that I can with the people around me, but nobody wants anything to do with me. I reach out to my Suboxone doctor at that point because they have me on Suboxone. I'm supposed to go to an Oxford house, but they want to take me off so abruptly that I know it's going to jeopardize my recovery. I reach out to him. I let him know about the circumstances that are surrounding this. I needed somebody to take my hand, and that's exactly what he did. He gave me an opportunity to live again when nobody else would give me the chance because they didn't trust me. And I know people that go in and out of rehabs for years and don't get the help that the opportunities I was given. And he did. He took my hand and he pretty much re-taught me how to live. When they're talking about needing a mentor in early recovery, it is the one thing that I say is probably the most important. He taught me I, I didn't know how to feed myself. I didn't have a cell phone, I didn't have a car, I had no communication with my children, my child, I'm sorry. I had no family to rely on, so he gives me a place to sleep. Within a month, he gives me a job. He teaches me how to pretty much feed myself, how to live again, how to become a dependable, reliable human being. I start to reconnect with my daughter, first through phone calls, then through visitation. I, uh, I learned how to sail that summer. I learned how to play tennis, two things I had never done in my life. And let me tell you, I've become a great tennis player and it is my outlet. And if I hadn't been given that opportunity by one, that one person, I don't know where I would be today. I, am, I don't know how, how to explain how grateful I am for that. Now, I am a person on medically assisted treatment, which means I am still on Suboxone to treat my, opio uh, to treat my substance abuse disorder. There is a lot of stigma about it. There's a lot of people that I know are against it. But for somebody like me, it has given me a chance to deal with life when I was completely overwhelmed. You get clean and they want you to go to IOP. They want you to do a hundred different things, deal with legal issues, and deal with all these different things that come up, you know, your brain is broken. You have depleted the chemicals that you need to survive like, you know, a person in society. So it's a bridge. It gives you the chance to get your brain working normally so that you can re-assimilate with your society. Otherwise, it takes at least a year for those brain chemicals to readapt. There's, you build a tolerance to these drugs, okay? And no matter what, you're not gonna feel right. You are not able to experience pleasure when you first get clean. You've depleted that ability in your brain. And something like Suboxone is able to help you feel joy in simple little things, to make you realize that life is worth living and you can do this without a substance. I do not believe that it's something that is supposed to be used long term. I believe that it is something that is supposed to be used to get you back on your feet when everything else around you has fallen apart. You need to be able to rely on yourself and you can't 
be worried about if you're going to be sick or how you're going to feel about a situation. It gives you that stability. And then eventually, as you rebuild your life, it's something that you come off of and you have a good grounding. It gives yourself, it can give you a valid shot in moving forward. So I'm going to wrap it up because I know I went over, but the one thing I can say is that you need to change everything in your life, or for those people that have ones in active addiction, the first step is to change everything. To rely on the people around you that love you, to know what's best for you, because you cannot make decisions for yourself. I have 14 months clean, and I am next week going to court to find out if I'm going to be getting my daughter back. I have done everything I possibly can to show the courts and to show my family what I'm capable of. Today, I have my mom, my dad, my three sisters. I have unsupervised visits with my daughter. I live in a great house with a great woman who is part of my support system, which is Donna, who everyone knows here. <laughs> She's given me a chance when no one else would either. And it's hard to take that risk, but if you feel that the person is really doing what's best for the recovery, you gotta believe a little bit in them because they could be me just looking for a hand to help when everything else is dark. Uh, YPR is another program that has given me a lot of hope. I've been able to work with the recovery community and that remains, keeps things fresh. If I ever forget that I am in recovery, you have to, you can't become compliant. That's, that's one of the problems. You have to remember where you came from. And I want to thank everybody for their time tonight. I'm, I'm sorry I went over, but <laughs> it's time to um, Next up is Deanna.
Uh, my mom didn't believe this at the time, and she looked it up, and he found out it was a lie, and he was arrested for possession of drugs, four counts to be exact. I was mad at him because I meant the 10 years of promises had all been lies. Uh, he didn't clean up, and he was going to be gone again, this time not only leaving me, my sister, but now also another brother. Um, I was mad at my aunt because she had lied to me, and the whole family kind of always wanted me to talk to them, but also knew at the same time not to push the topic. Um, ever since then, I've been become more sensitive to the topic of drugs, which is why this is extremely difficult for me. Um, but there are four things that I could always trust to keep me down. That would be my two parents, and one is my stepdad, who I consider my dad because of how close we are. In fact, the people who know us don't believe that we're step-related because of our special bonds. Um, my two best friends, who one of them is part of the YPR, and I would not be sitting here if it weren't for her, so thank you, Evelyn. Um, my two brothers, who are just adorable, and basketball. Um, Without basketball, I'd be completely lost. Uh, basketball is my out. If there's ever a time where I'm sad, I'm mad, I don't know what to do, I turn to basketball, which is something that I also have to thank my stepdad for. Um, I got involved because at the age of around eight or nine, he saw talent and he made me take that and run with it. Uh, a friend of mine had once said to me, it's his escape also, it's there for him when he's in pain and when he's angry or sad, and it's the only thing he can do at the end of the day, and to other people it's just a sport, and I couldn't agree with him more. Um, if I had to say just a few things, I want everyone in this room who is dealing with an addict in their life to remember, it would be not to blame themselves. You can't make them stop, they have to want to stop themselves. Don't be afraid to talk about it and find it out. Find your version of my basketball, something that is never going to go away. I believe we're all here for a purpose, and our purpose is not just to be a family member or a friend to an addict. That, may, that might be a part of who we are, but it will not define who I am, and I hope nobody in this room does either. I still think about my father all the time. I pray for him, and I hope he gets himself straight for good. And I'm extremely proud of the others of you in this room who have gotten yourself clean. And I understand addiction is a disorder. It starts with a choice, a choice he made. But I'll always be here for him, and I'm happy that he's going to try and get himself clean when he gets out. Thank you. Hi, my name is Dina. I also have a daughter that was a heroin addict. Um, it's going to be a little hard for me because it's new. I've only been three months since she passed. But um, she didn't die from heroin. She was given or sold pure fentanyl, which I haven't been able to figure out they said if it's elephant tranquilizers or carpet and all i guess that's what they're giving them down in florida we didn't have good insurance she just was given bad uh what's the word the detox programs that they have that these kids are going to they have uh headhunters they call them down in florida insurance scammers so it doesn't matter uh, who you are, what kind of insurance you have, the greatest insurance in the world. They're just going to try and keep you doing drugs and keep you in these rehabs to keep filling your insurance. My daughter finally did two months she had clean. It was the first time she ever stayed in a rehab. So I thought, my God, something's working. She's gotten into a good program. I got a phone call that she wanted to leave and she wanted to transfer. Something apparently happened in a, a few days. I, I couldn't understand it. I told her on Monday I'd get her out of there. She had to find somewhere else to go because she wasn't done completing her program. On Mother's Day, a car pulled up in front of my house. The rehab never even called me to this day to tell me she was in the hospital. 
I immediately went to Flora. I thought I was going to walk in. She was going to be awake by the time I got there. They told me she was sedated. And they were going to reevaluate her. Nobody told me anything. The rehab answer when I called them was, we're piecing things together. The hospital told me there were no drugs found known to their testing. I said, what does that mean? They said that carfentanil is popular. I said that she was in a rehab. None of her belongings were on her. Everything she had was back at the rehab. And her friends from the rehab started coming because I had to take her off the life support because she was brain dead. So everybody came to say their goodbyes. And then within a week of me being home, her roommate was found dead in the passenger seat of her car. And they believe the rehab was involved. So what I want to try and help people understand is don't entrust any of these detoxes to take care of your family member that they're going to get them into a good program because they're getting paid, some of them, not all of them. There are good programs out there, but I have taken the time to question why there was nowhere in New Jersey or Pennsylvania that would accept my daughter with Blue Cross and Blue Shields, why she had to go to Florida, why was it the only place that would cover everything? And I ask myself this question every day, why didn't I just take a few more days to sit there and, and question them? I just believe that they wanted to help my child. There's an investigation now into her death and into her roommate's death. And there was two previous girls before then that I found out about. When I was home for a week planning her funeral, this rehab that was supposed to be so wonderful sent me a bill. They paid for $72,000. My insurance company paid them $30,000. This was a place in Tom's River that sent my daughter to these rehabs in Florida. So if you have anyone that's in one of those rehabs or wanting to go to one of those rehabs, the West Palm Police Department has a list. There's only about six. If they're giving them free plane tickets, it's not somewhere you want your family member to go. But they can call down there and find out which ones are legitimate. And I'll have a list to give to Donna, when I get it from the detectives that are working down there, to hopefully put an end to the big crisis that our children here are going there, supposedly for treatment, but for not getting it. That's all I wanted to say. Thank you very much.
turns out the big one. Let's go. All right. Well, can't get it. Okay, Stacey, guys, this is the second time I'm doing this. Uh, I'm going to go around. Yeah, but they, they start to 